Welcome to the basics of reproductive isolation. Here I hope to help you understand exactly what reproductive isolation is, demonstrate a few of its manifestations, and hopefully get you thinking about its implications. Let's get started. The basic principles of natural selection aren't terribly hard to swallow. As a selective pressure is applied to a population, that population will either go extinct or adapt, that is, evolve to satisfy or cope with the change. Their ability to do so is of course reliant on random processes. They don't choose to adapt, it's simply an output of natural selection pruning the gene pool, favoring the random mutations that grant higher fitness. That's for a different lesson though. A selective pressure driving changes to morphology is well exemplified by the long neck of the giraffe, where the leading hypothesis states that the long neck is the result of competition for food. A longer neck meant less competition for leaves at the higher branches. Okay, fine. So natural selection can result in changes within a population through time. Let us not forget that genetic drift can, of course, also cause genotypic and phenotypic changes in a population. However, these changes don't directly affect fitness, but are still important to consider when thinking about all of this. Okay, so changes occur in a population as time progresses, either by natural selection or genetic drift. However, the keen-eyed observer may recognize that the world isn't populated by a single, ever-changing species, like a giraffe. In this example, even the tree that the giraffe is eating is a totally separate species. In fact, there are almost surely hundreds, and possibly even thousands of species within one square kilometer of where you sit right this very moment. How might the millions of species on our planet today have come to be? What caused populations to take divergent evolutionary tracks from one another? The answer to all of these questions lies in a principle called reproductive isolation, also known as RI. So, using this small model population of animals, let's take a look at how mutations can spread. Here they are, living their lives, occasionally dying, and occasionally reproducing successfully. As time proceeds, mutations occur. We will depict heritable mutations as little spots of color, making use of various colors to signify various mutations. Keep in mind, being heterozygous for a mutation means you'll only pass it on to your offspring about 50% of the time. In this current population, when mutations occur, they can potentially be spread throughout the population so long as they aren't selected against. In fact, in our example here, the mutation appears to be favorable as its frequency seems to be rising quite rapidly. So skipping ahead, we once again see how a population as a whole can change through time. But this will not give rise to a greater amount of species, simply a single, ever-changing one. Let's get down to the point already. How might this single population give rise to multiple different species? For this example, let's reset the mutations and suppose that a physical barrier breaks the population in two. We have chosen a river for this animation, though the barrier doesn't have to necessarily be a physical divider, just anything that can limit gene flow, that is, movement of alleles between the two groups. It should also be pointed out that a barrier such as this one doesn't necessarily have to completely abolish gene flow between these two new groups, it only has to reduce gene flow between them relative to within them. Now that we have a segregated population, the two environments on either side of the barrier may differ to some degree, as they do in this example. If this is the case, the processes to follow will occur much faster, as natural selection will be facilitating the genetic differentiation of these two groups. If the environments don't differ, the two groups will still likely become unique through genetic drift, which could feasibly take a bit longer. So, now that there's a barrier to reproduction between our two groups, a mutation occurring on one side of this barrier will be more easily spread throughout the group that it appeared in. Now we're getting somewhere. Fast forwarding a bit, we can now see that the group on the left differs to some degree from the group on the right. But how drastic is the difference? Do these two groups represent different species? 
Now we can finally ask the question, are these two groups reproductively isolated? Well, by virtue of just being separated from each other, some may call this isolation in itself, but we can't be sure if there is a solid biological source of any reproductive isolation until the groups have the opportunity to interbreed again, or at least attempt to. In our example, this opportunity may be granted to any animals brave enough to cross the river. This will give us the chance to examine a few types of RI. Firstly, in the case of differing environments, it could be that migrants have acquired a phenotype which has rendered them maladapted to the other environment. This wouldn't let them have as much of a shot at mating. It's also possible that the genetic changes unique to each group have caused a disruption in mating opportunities, such as differences in ornamentation, the time at which they breed, or even a mating ritual. What if their reproductive structures just don't fit together right? What if the gametes won't fuse? These are all types of prezygotic reproductive isolation because the mechanism preventing gene flow between the groups is occurring before the formation of a hybrid zygote. With this in mind, it makes sense that postzygotic reproductive isolation deals with how well the hybrids can survive and or reproduce. In this realm of RI, hybrids are formed, but the hybrids are inviable, infertile, or it could be that everyone just thinks they're plain ugly and won't mate with them. Again, these are all forms of postzygotic reproductive isolation because hybrid zygotes are formed but are at a reproductive disadvantage. So there you have it. If two groups are completely or nearly completely reproductively isolated, they are said to be two separate species under most definitions. While our example here involving a physical barrier is easy to depict, it should be remembered that a physical barrier is not necessary for this process to occur. For example, a difference in habitat alone will influence local adaptations, just as they did in our animals, though the local adaptations themselves would then be the beginning of the isolation process, rather than a physical barrier. So, recapping the lesson. Reproductive isolation can only occur when gene flow is restricted between groups. It will likely develop through genetic drift alone if gene flow is restricted enough. RI allows for genotypic and phenotypic divergence between groups. It is a process which can have many intermediate levels, though nearly complete RI designates separate species. It need not be occurring for a single group to evolve. And finally, RI is part of the process which has granted us all the different species and forms we see around us. Hopefully now you have a better idea of how speciation occurs. Thanks for tuning in.